Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Mike Salvati. Uh, I am the lead pastor of Christ the King Church. And if uh, we haven't had the chance to meet, um, maybe someday we will in, in person. But on Easter, typically uh, Christians greet one another with a, uh, he is risen and he is risen indeed. So I'm going to say he is risen and everybody else mouth it. Um, he is risen indeed. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. He is risen. Amen to that. Amen. Um, well, I just want to uh, uh, welcome you all, and I've got a couple announcements for us, uh, and uh, uh, we're going to start by talking about what Holy Week is. Um, Easter is the culmination of what Christians call Holy Week, and for us, it began this past Sunday. Um, we call it Palm Sunday, and Billy and I, one of our pastors, he preached a great sermon on the arrival of our King. Uh, this past Friday was Good Friday, and uh, we were talking about the crucifixion of our King, King Jesus. And today, Easter Sunday, we're going to be looking at the resurrection of our King Jesus. Now, I had some art up on, uh, on the landing page. It's called uh, A Detail of the Empty Tomb by Anne Cameron Coutry. If you're interested in that, just let me know. I'll be uh, putting that back up at the close of the, of the service today. Speaking of which... Uh, if you want to hang out afterwards, uh, I will be bringing the meeting to a formal end, and I'll be doing that uh, with another call to see you saying he is risen. Um, but then we will uh, formally end the Zoom meeting, but we can linger for a little bit, and it's a joy to hear what God has been doing in people's lives. So if you have time, please linger after the service. Um, and if this is your first time with us, uh, thank you for joining us. Please come back again uh, next Sunday for our next Sim Zoom service. Uh, but let me give you a sense of what's going to happen this morning for this morning's Easter service. In just a second, Eric um, Tully, one of our elders here at Christ the King Church, well, he's going to open up the service out of Psalm 16 and then pray a prayer. Uh, following that, Matthew and Stephanie Cap are going to lead out in singing Christ the Lord is risen today. Uh, if you just want to listen to them sing and be and be uh, benefit from that, great. If you want to sing from your homes, that's fine as well. Uh, Matthew and Stephanie, thank you for leading us in advance. After that, I'm going to read a, uh, a a portion of a devotional prayer called Resurrection out of the Valley of Vision, and then we're going to hear Luke 24 read it, almost in its entirety. But uh, Cindy and Tracy. Um, and Terry are going to read three different scenes from the Luke 24, all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is our capital H hope, and he is alive. After that, I'll, I'll preach, and then we'll recite the Apostles' Creed, and then I will close us with a benediction out of uh, Peter's Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, 22 through 32. That's where he uh, proclaims the risen Christ. And then we'll call it a wrap. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric Tully, who is going to open us up uh, from Psalm 16. Eric? Good morning. This is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land... They are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning grateful that we know you because you have made yourself known to us, first in creation, 
and then in your holy word, and then in the coming of Jesus Christ. We thank you that although we um, continually fall short of what you expect of us, that from the beginning of time you've set in plan, um, you've set in motion a plan of redemption to bring us back to yourself, to forgive us, and to give us hope in heaven forever. We celebrate this week when we remember Christ's death. And then this morning, we're so grateful that we can gather together as one body to rejoice in your glorious resurrection from the dead. We thank you that Jesus' resurrection teaches us that our sins are forgiven, that the price that he paid was sufficient. And we thank you that it also gives us hope that death is not the end and that Jesus is only the first to be raised from the dead in life forever. We're so grateful for this technology when we can gather together, and even though we're all uh, separated in our homes. We pray that you would be glorified in our service today, that we would be strengthened in our faith, that your spirit would be poured out on us even as we um, sing songs to you, hear from your word, and um, and gather together. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, Christ the King Church. Um, we want to wish you a happy Easter, and please uh, sing Christ the Lord is risen today with us. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Earth and heaven in chorus say, Alleluia. Praise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye hands and earth reply, Alleluia. Work is done. But the fight, the battle won. Hallelujah. Death in vain forbids him rest. Hallelujah. Christ has opened paradise. Thank you so much, Matthew and uh, Stephanie. And now uh, the reading of a portion of Resurrection from the Valley of Vision. Jesus strides forth as the victor, conqueror of death, hell, and all opposing might. He bursts the bands of death, tramples the powers of darkness down, and lives forever. He, my gracious surety, apprehended for payment of my debt, comes forth from the prison house of the grave, free 
and triumphant over sin, Satan, and death. Show me herein the proof that his vicarious offering is accepted, that the claims of justice are satisfied, that the devil's scepter is shivered, that his wrongful throne is leveled, Give me the assurance that in Christ I died, in him I rose, in his life I live, in his victory I triumph, in his ascension I shall be glorified. Amen and amen. Now before we get to the reading of Luke 24, uh, Cindy and Tracy and Terry are going to be uh, each reading a, a scene from that. I just wanted to kind of frame it for you just to give you a sense of what we're about to read. So at the end of Luke 23, late Friday afternoon, uh, the dead body of Jesus Christ was wrapped in a linen shroud and placed into the tomb, tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph was a rich man. Now the, the women who had followed Jesus from Galilee well, they had seen where this tomb was, and they actually saw how his body had been laid in the tomb. But because the Sabbath had begun, had begun that afternoon on that Good Friday at sundown, they were out of time. These, these women who were going to prepare his body, they, they couldn't prepare his body because you can't work on the Sabbath. So that these women presumably went back to the upper room where all the disciples had gathered in Jerusalem. And it was there that they would prepare the spices and ointment to finish the anointing of Jesus' dead body for burial. And so on that Good Friday, uh, they were not able to finish preparing the body. And they couldn't do anything on that Saturday, the Sabbath, because they couldn't work. So it was on the Sunday morning that their plan was to finish preparing Jesus' dead body for burial. So Luke 23 ends with the dead body of Jesus placed in a tomb, and Luke 24 begins on that Sunday with these same women returning to that same tomb to finish burial preparations for the body of Jesus Christ. And so Luke 24 is the resurrection account of Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke. And what you're about to hear read are three different scenes all on that same first Easter Sunday. So I'm going to put these, uh, these words back up, and then uh, Cindy is going to start reading, and may God bless the reading of his. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in a dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has arisen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, 
Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had even seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. <clears throat> and as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you please bow your heads with me as we turn to God's word? God in heaven, we do thank you so much for uh, your word. Thank you so much, God, that in your wisdom, you have given us this uh, resurrection account in Luke 24. And now, Lord Jesus, risen Christ, we ask that you would open our minds, that we may understand the significance that you are the Christ and that your death and resurrection were foretold, and that you are our capital H, hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, when... Um, we celebrate Easter, 
there are actually two kinds of chocolate Easter eggs that one can receive. The first kind of chocolate Easter egg is a cheap chocolate Easter egg that in four months from now, you'll find rolling around in some kind of drawer. And then there is the real kind of chocolate Easter egg that won't even last four days. So there are different kinds of chocolate Easter eggs. And there are different kinds of Sunday services. Here we are in a virtual Sunday morning service. We're hearing God's word proclaimed. We are worshiping the risen Christ. But then there is the in-person Sunday morning service where we gather together and we are in each other's physical presence. We see each other physically face to face. We are able to go hand in hand and embrace each other and worship the risen Christ in person. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day when we all can gather together again in one place at one time and sing praises to our great, great God. Did you know that there are two different kinds of hopes? Hope is a present confidence in a future outcome. And there are the small h hopes that tend to be circumstantial and temporal. And small h hopes show up in things like having hope in your future outcome of your health. Or the hope in the future outcome of your marriage or the hope in your future outcome of your job. Hope in the future outcome of your kids, hope in a future cure for the coronavirus, hope in the future health of our economy. All these small h hopes have to deal with future outcomes in this life. And then there's capital H hope. And capital H hope is bigger than any circumstance and it's eternal in its scope. And Christianity proclaims a capital H hope in the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus. Christians spell hope, J-E-S-U-S. And if you don't have capital hope in Jesus, what will happen is this. Uh, you will still set your hearts on small H hopes, because the world we live in is a very difficult world. But when those small H hopes fail to materialize, your life can be a disaster. But if you have capital hope in Jesus, you'll be able to endure anything that life throws at you. Because you've set your heart on a hope that goes beyond any circumstance and is eternal in its nature. Luke 24 is all about the capital H hope found in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So here is the claim of Luke 24. Jesus is alive. And he's the capital H hope for all who believe. And given this pandemic we're living in, all of us could use some of that capital H hope right now. So, well, here's what I'd like to do. Luke 24 has three scenes. We just heard Cindy and Tracy and Terry re read those three scenes. And so what I'd like to do is walk us quickly through those three scenes because they all have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they all make the claim that Jesus is alive and he is our capital H hope. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to walk us through quickly those scenes and I'm going to bring it to bear in our life because these scenes have some things in common. Scene 1, verses 1 through 12. At the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he was a, a rich man. The women arrive early Sunday morning, that first Easter Sunday, and they've returned, remember, to prepare, finish preparing the body of Jesus. But to their surprise and confusion, they find the stone that has been rolled away that blocks the entrance of the tomb. And there are two angels there, bedazzled in their appearance, and they basically say to them, hey, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And then they quote Jesus himself out of Luke 9 as saying that the Son of Man must be killed and be raised on the third day. These women remember what Jesus say, 
and there's a major dramatic change of course. They drop their embalming spices and they make a beeline back to the upper room in Jerusalem and they go and tell the 11 apostles and the other disciples in the upper room that they've seen the angels and that Jesus is alive. Well, of course, the apostles, they think it's an idle tale. They think it's a bunch of nonsense, but not Peter. Peter makes a beeline for the tomb, stoops inside, and looks in to find that the linen uh, garments that clothed the body of Jesus, well, they're there by themselves. And according to John 20, the very head covering has been folded. It's a dramatic transformation. That's scene one. In scene two, in 13 through 35, on the road to Emmaus, there's another scene of dramatic transfer, transformation. Now, Emmaus was a little village about seven miles due west of Jerusalem. And so you got to think about it as about a two and a half hour walk at a good pace, door to door. And we learned from verse 18 that there were two disciples of Jesus. One's name was Cleopas. They're not, the, they're not numbered with the 11. These are other disciples. And they were walking the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And we're not exactly told why. We only know that the Passover has ended and that their rabbi leader has now been killed. So in verse 14, these two disciples are walking along and talking about Jesus' death and trying to make sense of this new news that these women have brought to the disciples that they've seen angels and that Jesus is alive. And so while they're talking about this, the risen Jesus joins them. And in verse 16, we read that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So here's the scene. The risen Jesus shows up on the road to Emmaus, and yet he is unrecognized by these two disciples. And he kind of plays dumb. It's actually pretty funny. He starts asking them questions about what has happened, and what it reveals is how sad and disappointed in verse 21, hopeless, that these disciples were. And in 22 through 24, these, these disciples, they share with the risen but unrecognized Jesus the news that these women had come from the tomb, seen the angels, and have claimed that Jesus was alive. And it's really ironic, because here are these two disciples speaking to the risen but unrecognized Jesus, the claim that he's been risen. In 25 through 27, Jesus rebukes these two disciples. And he goes on to explain to them, because of their foolishness and slowness of heart to believe, how the Old Testament scriptures of Moses and prophets, the prophets, they said that the Christ would suffer and be glorified. The risen but unrecognized Jesus is basically giving a mobile crash course in the Old Testament Christology. He's teaching these disciples what the Old Testament said about the Christ that the Christ would suffer death and be raised to glory. It all had to happen according to the, the Old Testament. Well, in verses 28 to 31, they get to Emmaus. It's been about two hours of walking together and talking. And Jesus act, acts as though he's going to keep on going. So these two disciples invite Jesus to stay the night with them. They're being very hospitable. So he stays with them, and they sit at table together to share a meal. And the risen and yet unrecognized Jesus, he takes bread and breaks it, and he gives it to these two disciples, and immediately their eyes were open. They recognize Jesus for who he is. And he vanishes. He was recognized in the breaking of the bread. Do this in remembrance of me. And in verses 32 through 35, these two disciples, well, there's a dramatic change, of course. They get up, and they head back to Jerusalem. And I'm guessing they made the best time they have ever made from Emmaus to Jerusalem, those seven miles. And they get back to Jerusalem, and they find the other disciples, and they hear that Peter has seen the risen Christ, and then they share about their experience with Jesus on the road and then recognizing him in the breaking of bread. It's another scene of dramatic transformation. 
the last scene is in verses 36 through 49, and it's the scene in the upper room in Jerusalem. So these two disciples from Emmaus, they come back, and now all of the disciples are gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem. And as the disciples are gathered, they're trying to make sense of these resurrection appearances and claims. And then suddenly appearing in the middle of them is Jesus, the risen and recognized Christ. And he says, peace be to you. Well, immediately the disciples are frightened and troubled. They're not sure what's going on. They think that Jesus, the risen Christ, is a spirit, a ghost. So Jesus responds immediately by showing them his hands and his feet. And then surely the nails, holes that were in them. He does that to demonstrate that he's real, that he's been bodily raised from the dead. Well, then he goes on to ask, hey, do you have anything to eat around here? And they give him a piece of broiled fish, and he goes on to eat it in front of them. And it again demonstrates that Jesus has been raised bodily from the dead. But it doesn't end there. In verses 44 to 46, in this upper room in Jerusalem with all of his disciples, he again explains how his death and resurrection are the fulfillment of what was written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. That he had to die and be raised according to the scriptures. It was God's plan all along. He then goes and tells his disciples that he's going to send them to the nations. And they need to wait in Jerusalem to be receive the promised Holy Spirit from his Father. And they're going to go from hiding in their holy huddle in this upper room to being sent to the nations as witnesses of the crucified and risen Christ. Again, it's another scene of dramatic transformation. So all these scenes de depict these disciples as being transformed, of going from a state of confusion to a state of bold witness. And in fact, all three scenes share some common features. You have confused disciples, and then you have a claim made about Jesus the Christ, and then there's this moment of clarity, and then there is this dramatic change of course. So we can see the confusion in the disciples in that first scene, the women at the tomb. Remember, they were perplexed. They were sad and mourning. Verse 4, on the road to Emmaus, the two, well, they were confused, trying to make sense of everything that had happened in Jerusalem. 21, they were sad. 16, they were sad. 21, they were hopeless. The disciples in the upper room, when Jesus shows up, they are sent into a tailspin of fear and being troubled. Each scene begins with some kind of confused state among the disciples. Now, we all can relate with a state of confusion right now, I'm guessing. I mean, how are you supposed to know how to live through a global pandemic if you've never lived through one before. And that's where we all find ourselves. We've got information coming at us in, 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 in spurts. This is a developing situation. And so we're kind of working with partial information and trying to make sense of it all. And it can be very confusing. It can be a source of sadness. We have people we know who are dying, so we can find ourselves in a state of mourning can create anxiety and fear, trying to make sense of things. We know what it's like to be confused. We can identify. But, but maybe this morning you're just confused about Jesus. You're thinking, what's the big deal? What does it matter that this Jesus died and was raised from the dead? What difference does that make for me now? Well, it's all about capital H hope. Hope that goes beyond this life and beyond your grave. We all understand this state of confusion. But it's not just a state of confusion we see. We see a claim that's made in all three scenes. 
a claim about the Christ, that he is in fact alive at the tomb. The people that make the claim are two angels. Remember they say, he's not here, but he's risen? They're like, duh. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Did he not say he was going to be killed and on the third day be raised? It's the third day. He's not here. He's alive. These angels are making the claim of Jesus that he would be raised on the third day. He is alive. And then on the road, this claim shows up when the risen and unrecognized Jesus does this mobile Christology lesson from the Old Testament with these two disciples. He shows them from the scriptures that the Christ had to suffer to be glorified. He had to die and be raised. Wouldn't you have loved to have been with them on the road to hear how Jesus explained from, the, from Moses and from the prophets how they pointed to him, the Christ, having to die and be raised? I mean, did he, did he bring him to Genesis 3.15? Did he, did he bring him to Deuteronomy 18? Did he bring him to Isaiah 53? I think he did bring him to Isaiah 53. Because in Luke twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus already quotes Isaiah 53 to his disciples that he needed to be numbered with the transgressors. Man, I would have loved to have been there. It's the claim that Jesus is alive. And then in the upper room, we see this claim again. Jesus is suddenly standing among his disciples, and he addresses first their fears by showing them his resurrected body. And then he doesn't stay there. He, he points them to the scriptures. What the law and the prophets and the Psalms said must happen to the Christ, that he must die and be raised. The law and the prophets and the Psalms, they represent the three major sections of the entire Old Testament. Where did he bring them? I'm guessing he pointed them to Psalm 16 or Psalm 22, both Psalms that anticipate the resurrection of the Christ. What we see in all three scenes is these confused disciples being met with the biblical claim that the Christ had to die and be raised from the dead, and that Jesus is the Christ. He's alive. The claim of Luke 24 is that Jesus is alive, and he is our capital H hope. The Christ had to die. He had to be raised because the scriptures foretold it. But maybe you're sitting right now wondering, why? Why would the scriptures foretell the Christ having to have to die and be raised. Because it's through Christ's death and resurrection that God would offer salvation to all sinners everywhere. Christ had to die and he had to be raised so that God could save sinners like you and me. Here's what the Bible teaches. Jesus died in the place of sinners. And he died the death that we all deserve. He himself was innocent. He never sinned once. And he willingly took our place on the cross. And his resurrection is the proof that, in fact, he conquered sin and death. That he paid for our sin in full, and it's been accepted. That's what the resurrection says. It gives us hope. And now God offers salvation to all people everywhere only through Christ's death and resurrection. There's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. So this claim that Jesus is alive is actually good news for sinners like you and me, because it's through Christ's death and resurrection that God offers salvation to all, the forgiveness of sins. In fact, it's more important than finding a cure for the coronavirus. Because your biggest need is a spiritual need. We go from seeing disciples confused to these, these claims about the Christ now to this moment of clarity. Let's call it an aha moment of clarity. We see it at the tomb, verse 4. 
the angels tell the women, hey, uh, Jesus said he was going to die and then on the third day be raised from the dead. And they remember. It's the aha moment. He's alive. On the road, in verse 31, Jesus opens the eyes of the two disciples in the breaking of bread. Do this in remembrance of me. It's the aha moment. They recognize him. And they remember how when Jesus taught them that mobile Old Testament lesson on what the Christ must endure, their hearts burned within them. In the upper room, that aha moment came in verse 45 when Jesus opens the minds of his disciples to understand that he is the Christ and that he had to die and be raised according to God's plan in order to save sinners. The moment, this moment of clarity, this aha moment, follows the claim of Scripture that Jesus had to die and be raised. He is our capital H hope. And here's what that means for us. Have you had that aha moment of clarity? Have you realized that not only is Jesus Christ, not only did he die, and not only was he raised for the sinners of the world, that he died and he was raised for you. That he gave up his body and then he was raised from the dead so that your sins can be forgiven. Have you had that aha moment? If you haven't, there's no better time than Easter Sunday than to become a follower of Jesus, to put your faith in the crucified and risen Christ, and he promises that your sins will be forgiven. Our biggest problem is not the coronavirus. It's our spiritual rebellion against God. Have you had that aha moment? Or maybe there's another kind of aha moment. Many of us, when we read an account like this in Luke 24, we compartmentalize our thinking. We think, oh yeah, that's what the Bible teaches about Jesus. He was crucified and then he was raised three days later. And we don't realize what that means for us today. And what that means for us today is that Jesus is alive today. He's alive right now. In fact, what we read in the rest of Luke 24 is that Jesus brings his disciples to Bethany, and before them he's carried up into heaven. And what the rest of the New Testament says is that Jesus is right now seated at the right hand of God on high. And Ephesians 1.22 says that God has put in placed all things under the feet of the risen Christ, which means this, that not only is Jesus alive, he's reigning over all, which means he's over the coronavirus, which means he's using the coronavirus. How so? To expose our small age hopes in this world in order to help us see the need for capital H hope in Jesus. So not only is the risen Christ over the coronavirus, not only is he using it, he promises that he's in it with us. Have you had that moment of clarity, that aha moment, just like the disciples did in Luke 24? Well, that brings me to the change of course. We've seen the confusion, the claim, the clarity, and now the dramatic change of course. At the tomb, the women, when they remember the claim of Jesus, there's a dramatic change of course. They, they drop their embalming spices and they make a beeline to the upper room in Jerusalem to tell the disciples that what they saw and that Jesus is alive. That is a dramatic change of course. We also see it on the road. Cleopas and the other disciple, after Jesus reveals himself to them through the breaking of the bread, they remember all that he taught them and their hearts are burning, and they get up, and they make a beeline back to Jerusalem, to the upper room, in order to tell them 
the disciples what they have witnessed. It's a dramatic change, of course. They're, they're no longer sad. They're no longer hopeless. They are now full of joy and hopeful in going back to Jerusalem to bear witness of what they have experienced and seen. In the upper room, after Jesus opens the minds of his disciples to understand why he, the Christ, had to die and be raised, he goes and tells them, I'm going to be sending you to the nations, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be my witnesses to all people everywhere that God offers salvation through my death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. And we see that played out in the book of Acts. These disciples were dramatically changed, a dramatic change, of course. They go from being confused to being courageous, courageous witnesses of Jesus. And for us today, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a capital H hope in the risen Savior that we must proclaim to people who are trying to find their hope in small h hopes. What an opportunity we have to point them to a hope eternal. Each of these scenes show us a dramatic transformation from confusion to claim to clarity to a courageous change of course. The coronavirus and its threat to our, our physical health and our economic health and our social health, it's not the biggest danger we face today. The biggest danger we face today is a spiritual pandemic. Sin is in each of us. And we all need forgiveness more than a cure for the coronavirus. Because if we stand before the risen Christ, the judge someday, and our sins are not forgiven, we will be facing his just and holy judgment. So in light of that threat, that danger, we run to Jesus, our capital H hope. And we tell others about Jesus, that his death and resurrection offers a hope beyond the grave. And when you put your faith in the risen Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you will find a new confidence in the eternal outcome of your soul. Because you're bound up with Jesus. And you are united to him in his death in his resurrection, you find a capital H hope that will help you endure. You are no longer afraid of the greatest enemy, death, because Christ's death and resurrection has conquered it. Now that's good news of a capital H hope that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Thank you for these resurrection accounts in Luke 24. And God, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we can see that the risen Christ is alive and reigning. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now let's go to the reciting in response of the Apostles' Creed. Would everybody please... Uh, Read out loud with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now for a benediction, I'm going to read for you Acts out of, out of Acts 2. This is 
uh, the Apostle Peter's sermon at Pentecost after Jesus had been raised. He says this in Jerusalem. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, Peter says, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and, and of that we are all witnesses." Amen and amen. And now, for our closing prayer, would you bow with me? O risen Jesus, there is none like you, and salvation is found in no one else. You are our greatest hope, our capital H hope. And trusting in you gives us a confidence now that we need not fear death. We need not fear a coronavirus. We need not fear an economy with question marks. God, you have settled our greatest problem in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray with hearts full of hope Amen. Well, one last time, I'm going to say he is risen. And would you respond with he is risen indeed? And we'll call that a close to our Easter service. If you want to linger, please do. I'll unmute us all at that point. He is risen. He's risen indeed. May God bless you today, Christ the King Church. Go with fullness of hope. Amen and amen.